It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, to the RA two ministers uh, from the government of Saskatchewan. Uh, they, are, they are attending today. Uh, First Minister of Health, Paul Merriman. He was first elected to the Saskatchewan legislature in uh, 2011 and he was re-elected in 2016. He served as Minister of Social Services and Government uh, House Leader. He served as the Deputy Government House Leader as well as Government Whip. On, on November 9, 2020, Premier Scott Moe appointed him as Minister of Health. Uh, the Minister of Mental Health Addictions, um, Seniors and Rural and Remote Health, Everett Hindley. Mr. Everett Hindley was first elected as the MLA for Swift Current in the 2018 by-election, and he was re-elected in 2020 in uh, the provincial uh, election. Upon the Saskatchewan Party's election as government in 2007, Minister Hindley served as the executive assistant to the Premier, and in November of uh, 2020, Premier Scott Moe appointed him as Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, Seniors and Rural and Remote Health. Welcome, Ministers, to the Representative Assembly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stride. I'm a very uh, pleased to join you with Minister Hindley today and all of the uh, delegates that are here today um, addressing what we have uh, uh, in our, con in our uh, province as far as our, our healthcare concerns. I want to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to all of you for your incredible efforts and hard work during what has been a very challenging year. As physicians, you are at the forefront and we continue to manage COVID-19 and take steps to recover our healthcare system from the last two years. I want to acknowledge the fatigue and the frustration that many of you are feeling with the continued demands in a constantly changing environment. On behalf of Premier Scott Moe and the government of Saskatchewan and myself as, as a community member and as a citizen, I want to say thank you for everything that you've done over the last two years. As we focus on the pandemic over the last two years, it strained our resources and limited our ability to deliver adequate level of services in other areas like surgery. With vaccinations available and treatments, we now can start to move ahead to address other demands while we continue to learn to live with COVID. I'm pleased that Saskatchewan is getting back on track with a much improved financial picture and a plan to tackle important priorities, including those affecting our healthcare system. This year's provincial budget makes the largest investment in Saskatchewan history. It provides substantial funding for health programs and services, acute and emergency care, mental health and addiction, supports and key infrastructure projects. Our goal is to start by addressing pressing issues and get our health care system back on track for the future. I will speak to some of the priorities that are more relevant to physicians. Both Minister Hindley and I are well aware of the conversations that we've had with our health care providers and our health care system community leaders that recruitment and retention is top of mind. We recognize the people who deliver the patient care are the foundation of our health care service. We have dedicated, compassionate health professionals like you in the province who have worked very hard and made sacrifices over the last couple of years. We know resources are strained, there is fatigue, and we want to support you the best we can. We have a four-point plan to address the health human resource needs and restore and maintain health services in Saskatchewan. This plan includes the creation of a new recruitment crown agency, international recruitment, training seats for physicians and nurses, a retention program, and incentives for key positions. On the first point, planning has begun to establish a new independent agency dedicated to the recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals. The Saskatchewan, <clears throat> excuse me, the Saskatchewan Healthcare Recruitment Agency, the SHRA, will help attract the best and brightest to join our friendly welcoming communities. We will actively recruit across the province, around the country, and overseas. This agency will closely collaborate with healthcare employers and communities to address short-term needs while finding long-term solutions, especially to the challenges of rural communities. The second part of our plan is an international recruitment to support the budget and includes $1.5 million in one-time funding for recruitment incentives. This is part of a recruitment mission to the Philippines to attract qualified candidates and hard to fill critical sector positions. <coughs> Excuse me. The Ministry of Health is working with the Ministry of Immigration and Career Training 
as well as the Ministry of Advanced Education on this initiative. The goal for the first phase is to recruit 150 healthcare professionals into Saskatchewan this year, with the second phase to follow. The third part of our plan is to train more healthcare professionals here in the province. New funding in this year's budget will increase the number of specialty family medicine and nurse training seats. Our new family medicine training seats will be added to the Southeast Saskatchewan through the distributed medical education for a total of 52 seats across the province. We have a strong retention rate over the past five years with 84% of family residency graduates who are trained in rural and regional sites remained in our province. Also, the College of Medicine will add four new training seats for post-grad residency training targeted for priority specialty areas, physician specialty areas. We will have a total of 128 seats, including the new Southeast Family Medicine seats. The number of post-secondary seats for nurses will expand by 150. The fourth part of our plan is to track and retain specialists and physicians in expanding intake for programs like SIPA and enhance rural practice incentive incentives for physicians. Minister Henley will touch more on that in a minute. In addition, this budget provides an increase of $5.2 million for funding for new physician contracts to help out with recruitment. We trust that all of these effort, efforts will help to address the demand for additional healthcare professionals to meet the needs of Saskatchewan patients and communities. One other important area that we're working to get back on track is surgeries. An additional $21.6 million in the budget is specifically dedicated to reduce the surgical wait list by supporting thousands of additional procedures in the upcoming fiscal year. By prioritizing surgeries and setting aggressive, achievable goals, Saskatchewan will deliver the largest volume of surgical procedures in the history of the province this year. The goal is to reach a surgical volume of 97,000 procedures in 22-23. This investment marks the start of a three-year plan to eliminate the COVID-related surgical backlog and return to pre-COVID wait times by the end of March 2025. Our government is also committed to getting emergency medical services back on track. We will address critical areas of need with a dedicated focus on rural and remote and Northern communities. Minister Henley will again touch on that in a minute. I wanna to touch on virtual care, another important area that has come to the forefront during the pandemic. Saskatchewan has quickly adopted new ways to safely connect patients to their doctors and other healthcare professionals without leaving their home through virtual care. Our residents have had millions of virtual care appointments over the past two years. This spring, we asked patients and healthcare workers about their experience with virtual care. I hope many of you are taking the opportunity to participate in that public engagement. The information that we will gather will use to develop a long-term provincial strategy around the future of virtual care, and your input on this is extremely important. As we continue to live with COVID-19, significant dollars have been allocated for COVID-19 response and recovery measures. This year budget provides $95 million to sustain, sustain the ongoing COVID-19 response and continue protecting Saskatchewan people. This funding will cover PPE supplies, vaccination, infection prevention in long-term care homes, and temporary acute, temporary acute care beds in Regina and Saskatoon. In closing, I wanna reiterate how much I personally and the entire government appreciate the efforts that has been proved, that has been provided to us for the long haul in the last two years. While COVID is still with us and will likely continue to be so in the foreseeable future, I feel we've learned a lot together and we're better equipped to move forward. We still have a long road ahead, but I'm optimistic for the future and I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you very much for listening. And I would like to personally thank the board uh, for inviting Minister Henley and I uh, up yesterday to have a very good discussion on primary care and family medicine, and also the evening that we had with the executive last night. It was very enjoyable. Thank you very much. Minister Henley. 
Thanks, uh, Minister Merriman, and, and good morning to everyone. Good to see some familiar faces on here uh, once again, including some from uh, back home in, in Swift Current as well. And I'd like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to, to everyone who's here today and for everything that you've done for our healthcare system over the past uh, couple of years in particular, but uh, uh, throughout the years here in our province. Um, as Minister Mer uh, Merriman talked about, there's a number of significant investments in uh, this year's budget and uh, some important programs and services for our residents that we're hoping to strengthen and help us support in, uh, our healthcare workforce. Uh, he, he spoke about some of those priority areas and I'll touch on a few of the other ones, including rural and remote health, mental health and addictions, and also seniors, which are also uh, all parts of, of my portfolio. Um, under the area of uh, recruitment and, and retention uh, for rural and remote areas, there are a, a number of initiatives with a dedicated focus on these parts of, of Saskatchewan to address some of the challenges that communities are, are facing. And as Minister Merriman noted, the new Saskatchewan Healthcare Recruitment Agency will be responsible for recruiting not just physicians, but also nurses and other high priority, uh, high priority health professionals that are, are needed across this province with a uh, specific focus on communities where there are shortages that are currently causing some of the disruptions, temporary disruptions to services. We know that this is a, a, an important area, not just to, to be successfully recruiting healthcare professionals by offering the right incentives, but it's also important to, to try to make sure we're doing a better job of retaining healthcare professionals. And I think that new agency will uh, play an important role in helping uh, to uh, helping these newly recruited health professionals integrate into uh, communities across Saskatchewan. Minister Merriman and myself both recently attended the uh, SUMA and SARM conventions where our engagement with community uh, leaders was very helpful. The first time in a couple of years we've been able to do it uh, uh, in person. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear uh, their perspectives both at the bear pits but also in separate dialogue sessions and to talk a bit about their role in liaising with the communities uh, between government and communities as we try to solve some of these challenges together. And another important part of our four point plan regarding rural and remote uh, health care in Saskatchewan is increasing the number of uh, internationally trained family physicians. We're providing some additional funding to the SIPA program to expand intake and also provide further support. The uh, number of SIPA seats will uh, increase by 25% from 36 seats to 45 seats annually. And due to the success of SEPA, there are currently uh, 257 additional physicians practicing in the province with the vast majority of them, roughly 78% in rural or regional communities. There will also be enhanced support of uh, four physicians following their SIPA participation, as well as resources and mentorship as well uh, for these physicians as they establish practices in a variety of communities. In addition to the SIPA program, we also know that it's important that we have a strong focus on training and retaining uh, homegrown physicians, those that are born and raised in Saskatchewan, making sure that we can incorporate them into our communities as well. The Rural Physician Incentive Program will also receive additional funding to make changes to better retain physicians in our rural communities. Health system partners will be engaged to help determine the most effective improvements. When it comes to emergency medical services, key commitments in this year's budget will also see significant expansion in acute and emergency care across our urban and rural communities. A funding increase of nearly $11 million will help stabilize emergency medical services, particularly in rural and remote areas through several different initiatives. A majority of the funding will add paramedics, put more ambulances on the roads in 27 rural, remote and northern communities. It will add nearly 71 full-time equivalent positions and increase capacity to provide a stable level of service and respond to emergencies in a timely manner. Also, community paramedicine will expand to several rural, northern, and First Nations communities with funding provided for staffing and training. We know there's more work to do, and this is a start on uh, making some of those improvements to help stabilize EMS across this province. In the area of mental health and addictions, uh, we all know someone, I believe, who has been uh, touched or experienced a mental health uh, or addiction issue. And our government will continue to work to, to help deliver those services by investing the largest amount of uh, dollars ever to help support Saskatchewan people. This uh, area of focus will receive a significant increase of $8 million for targeted initiatives, provide counseling and treatments, reduce harms associated with substance use and advance proactive prevention measures, particularly for kids and youth. The additional investment in this year's budget includes funding for the continued implementation of commitments made in the previous budget. We'll get back on track launching new harm reduction initiatives that were delayed by COVID-19 supply chain related issues and some of the other challenges. 
We'll continue to establish uh, and continue the work to establish integrated youth services models in this province to better coordinate services for youth. Uh, our mental health capacity building initiative, which uh, partners with school divisions, is going to be expanded to more schools with an additional $800,000 investment in this year's budget. And there were a few more details released on that uh, earlier this week that now uh, provides some uh, details for how uh, school divisions can apply uh, for that funding. This year's budget will also fund recent recommendations and priorities released by the Saskatchewan Drug Task Force. And this work reflects extensive consultations with a wide range of partners across Saskatchewan. And that includes people with lived experience. And in this year's budget, we've allocated $1 million specifically for the Drug Task Force findings. Uh, some of that uh, money will be uh, specifically targeted for uh, an initiative known as Hot Spotting, a locally integrated overdose response type of project that's been tried successfully in some other jurisdictions jurisdictions and we're uh, looking forward to getting that initiative off the ground very soon. Significant progress has been made through record investments in recent years, but we recognize that there is still more work to do when it comes to addressing mental health and addictions issues. The budget also uh, responds to concerns we've heard about barriers created by wait times for detox and treatment and while also ensuring that harm reduction services and supplies are efficiently offered to Saskatchewan people, regardless of, of where they live in the province. And uh, specific to the, the treatment end of things, there is uh, $2.1 million to uh, be directed towards the first tranche of funding for the 150 additional treatment spaces that we're hoping to add uh, in this province over the next three years. Uh, in the area of seniors, uh, seniors care also remains an important focus for our government. A $17 million budget increase uh, this year will enhance services to help seniors live safely and comfortably in their communities, strengthen long-term care and home care. This year, we're adding an additional 117 continuing care aids to home care and long-term care. With these positions, we will have added 225 of our commitments to add 300 positions as per the election. And in addition to that, we also know in, in the conversations that I have with seniors and older adults across this province and advocacy groups that aging in place is a priority. So we have some dollars specifically targeted towards uh, funding increases for home care, for individualized care, and continuing to have the conversations about aging in place models and how the provincial government can help to work with uh, seniors and older adults to, to further enhance and, and, and head down that road towards those types of models in this province. Also, to better protect seniors against influenza, we will be offering high-dose influenza vaccine to all Saskatchewan residents aged 65 and older. Our physicians have played an important role in helping deliver vaccinations for both influenza and also COVID-19, and I want to thank each and every one of you for that important work. So in conclusion, these are just some of the highlights of how our government is planning to get the healthcare system back in track to better help support you and the very important that uh, you work, uh, the work that you do in supporting patients. Uh, we want to be there to help support our healthcare providers and that includes our physicians. Minister Merriman and I uh, greatly appreciated the ongoing collaboration that we have had uh, since our time being in, in these portfolios. We thank the SMA and its leadership as we work to find the best possible solutions we can to support physicians and help address the challenges that uh, you are facing and turn to all of us here in government and across this uh, province are facing. So uh, with that, I just want to uh, thank everyone for the opportunity to say a few words this morning and uh, we would be uh, pleased to take your questions. Ministers, thank you. The ministers have graciously allowed time to receive questions from RA delegates. Please remember, once you're invited to speak, speak loudly and clearly, state your name, and please be brief with your question so as to enable all interested delegates the opportunity to ask a question. You will have two minutes to ask your question, so please refer to the timer on your screen. While delegates are gathering their uh, questions, I, I want to say to the ministers, uh, in my role as speaker and in my work as a surgeon, I get to indulge, indulge my fanaticism for sticking to a schedule. So I'm really grateful to both of you for joining us at the time scheduled. Uh, it's very considerate, thoughtful, and thank you for that. Do we have any questions? Please, uh, who's the first person to speak? We have a few questions. Our first question is from Dr. Bossen from Regina. Dr. Bossen, good morning. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hear me? 
Perfect. Uh, I'm Sanjay Pasin. I'm one of the gastroenterologists in Regina. I'm one of the RA delegates from Regina as well. Um, my question is actually about access to timely and continuous outpatient psychiatric care. Now, as a gastroenterologist, we refer patients who have functional or irritable bowel syndrome that's severe, typically driven by anxiety, depression, that's quite pathologic. Um, recently, I, I, I've found that we've had significant delays to access of, to care and mental health, um, most, and most notably because there are no active community psychiatrists accepting any new referrals for patients between 18 and 65 in the city of Regina, and this is up to date as of a week ago. Um, this is a problem, and, and I brought this up to our colleagues in psychiatry in Regina, and they're aware of this problem. In fact, even patients who enter the hospital system have difficulty accessing outpatient care because there are no community psychiatrists accepting patients. It's, to me, um, frustrating because we've had a residency program in psychiatry in Regina now for a number of years. I believe we've produced at least eight psychiatrists through that program, of which only two have been retained. Um, part of the challenge has been many of these trainees um, have to do a return of service that's mandated in rural communities when the needs are in the city and they want to stay in the city. And when someone, for example, who's from Toronto is forced to work in a small community where they don't want to be, um, they tend to leave the province as soon as their return of service is done. What kinds of steps can are, are we looking at as far as apologize mental health? For, for breaking in, and I apologize for not starting the timer when you started speaking. I think we are getting pretty close to the end okay. of your time. Yeah. So I was just I just wanted to question. bring that up and, and see what the approach is and, and how the ministry can sort of withdraw some of those restrictions for these College of Medicine trainees to keep people in the cities because I think patients would rather have a specialist that can come to in the cities than worrying about uh, the recruitment and retention of psychiatrists in smaller communities at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Ministers, who would who would tackle that? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bassin, for, for raising that uh, that point. You know, you make an excellent point, and, and it's it's one of the increasing pressures that we're that uh, we're facing uh, in a number of areas when it comes to healthcare uh, in this province. I think at last check, I think we had a roughly 120 licensed psychiatrists in in the province. It's my understanding that's a stat from earlier this spring, and it's my understanding <clears throat> that there were uh, that uh, there were also a 38 residents in the psychiatry a residency program at the U of S's College of Medicine. In, uh, in residency years one to five, um, but it, it's interesting to hear uh, the comments that you've made with respect to to where uh, the uh, with return to service where where the psychiatrists are are being uh, I guess for lack of a better word allocated in, in the province, and uh, it's something we can we can definitely take a look at. We we know that there's pressures when it comes to increased demand for mental health and, and addiction supports, and, and that definitely includes whether it's psychiatrists, registered psychiatric nurses on that front, we're adding some more seats in this year's budget on on. The, on the RPN uh, training seat side of things, knowing, of course, that doesn't solve some of our immediate pressures when it comes to that area. But um, I think that's one of the goals of this new healthcare recruitment agency is to look at some of these individualized challenges such as this to say, you know, here's an area where uh, perhaps we need to to make some tweaks and and uh, uh, reimagine how, how we're doing this. And and uh, and, and I uh, gratefully you've actually raised it here today. That's something that we can definitely take back with our officials. Look at what the balance is, and there's pressures for us on both sides of it. There's pressures in, in our urban centers in Regina and Saskatoon, but there's also uh, demands out in, in rural Saskatchewan and northern and, and remote communities as well. So let us take a look at that, Doctor Basin, to see if we can uh, have a look at at how that balance is is uh, being affected right now in terms of uh, our recruitment and retention of psychiatrists in this province. Uh, um, if if there's uh, if we do need to make some changes, we should probably definitely be taking a look at, uh, uh, at what those could possibly look like. So thanks for raising the question. Thank you. Julie, who's the next delegate who'd like to speak? Our next delegate is Dr. Sanderson from South Central. Dr. Sanderson, good morning. Please go ahead. You have two minutes. Good morning. Um, hi, Minister. Thank you for your address and attending. Um, I'm a full service family physician in uh, Moose Jaw. Um, I have about an 1800 patient load with many, many complex patients on that load. My question is uh, towards the family medicine piece. Um, you mentioned that you're increasing, looking at increasing numbers of family uh, physicians and also that retention was fairly good in um, Saskatchewan. 
Um, my, uh, with respect, I tend to find that politicians tend to like to throw numbers and money at things uh, because that pleases the voters. But actually, it doesn't show the true picture, which is where are all these family physicians going? Are they actually going into full service family practice and providing um, a opportunity for every person in Saskatchewan to have a family physician. Um, how will you address the fact that actually um, the, the thing is not numbers, it's not money, it is actually inefficiencies in the number of family physicians who are actually going into other contracts, hospitalists, um, CCAs, that sort of thing. We actually need family physicians in full service practice, seeing enough patients per day with enough patient loads. Thank you. Uh, ministers? Sorry for the delay. I just was uh, was muted there uh, uh, from your end. Um, this was something that was discussed, uh, probably the main topic when we just uh, had a meeting with the board yesterday on primary care and family medicine and people transitioning from family medicine into other specific areas in the hospital to be able to get um, hospital uh, access and privileges. It's something that we're certainly looking at. And uh, w as far as what we're doing with, with money, we know we have to increase the funding in this area. And we know we have to look at retaining certain individuals into family medicine. This is something that, from my knowledge, has been brought up uh, a couple of years. That's why we increased the family medicine seats this year. And we're going to continue to look at that. We want to make sure that we're the best person to probably work in family medicine is somebody that has a family here in Saskatchewan. So we wanna be able to make sure that we're getting those individuals through the process and then we're retaining them. Um, the number is, I think I, that I put out there was 84% of retention, but we've got some work to do on that. We really do. We wanna make sure that we're getting all of those physicians that are graduating, not just from our medicine school, but other medicine schools, um, med schools to be able to uh, work in Saskatchewan and remain in family medicine. If there's something that we have to look at in the future, as far as, uh, incentivizing family medicine, then we can certainly have that opportunity to be able to look at that. But this was discussed at length from the board from about five or six different board members with different perspectives on it. Um, and it's something that we will certainly take back and have a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Dr. Sanderson. Julie, who's the next speaker? We have 10 more hands up and we have Dr. Loden next from far northwest. Dr. Lodum, please go ahead. Hi there. Thanks, ministers, for your address. Uh, I'm Steve Lodum. I'm a family physician in Meadow Lake. I was hoping to just clarify with your comments on the Health Human Resources Plan. Um, mm -hmm. Would that plan have the scope to also include other allied health workers, such as um, ultrasonographers, uh, lab, lab and x-ray technologists and, and um, physiotherapists. Uh, and there's probably others like social workers, but I just, I just think that those are some of the services that we are, we are lacking that's impairing our ability to, to really provide the full services that we're capable of locally. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for, for the question. question. Uh, great question, and, and I didn't cover that in my opening remarks. Uh, probably everybody on this call will recall SASC Docs, where we very focused in on recruitment of doctors and uh, surgical uh, clinicians from around the world. What we're doing now is with this new Health Human Resource Agency is we're broadening the scope of that. Um, SASC Docs was in the ministry, and then uh, when the SHA was formed, it was moved into the SHA. Now it's going to be out with the Treasury Board crown that's going to have um, various people have a board and various people that are going to be looking at all different areas of healthcare, not just uh, doctors, uh, but nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, clinicians, continuing care aides. Uh, lab techs is another one that we have some shortages of across the province. So we're going to be working with the local areas to be able to identify what is out there that is needed and how this Health Human Resource Agency can identify those individuals and then go out and recruit them. So we will be looking at a very broad spectrum of individuals within the healthcare community to be able to make sure that uh, we're not just having the doctors, but we're also having the support teams in and around them. Minister Hindley. 
Yeah, if I could just add to that, uh, Dr. Lowen, thanks for the, for the question. And, and you're exactly right. Um, I, I've dealt with and spoken to a number of uh, physicians and uh, community leaders across this province where we have some temporary service disruptions right now. And you're right. It's not, uh, it, it, in some of these cases, it's actually not doctors. It's, you know, we don't have uh, enough nurses to be able to, for them to be, to legally open um, to the hours that they're supposed to be open, whether it's an ER or acute beds or whatever it happens to be. So uh, Minister Merriman uh, hit the nail on the head, but that's precisely it. We uh, we have more than uh, than uh, just uh, family physicians that we're trying to uh, recruit and retain in this province. It's, as uh, Minister Merriman said, RNs, LPNs, continuing care aides, lab techs. You know, in the case of my home community in Swift Current right now, it's a, a lab at the Cypress Regional Hospital isn't operating at full capacity because we have some, some shortages there. So they're operating on reduced hours. And there's uh, several other communities right now that are in a, a temporary service disruption. So that's why we've, we've identified this. Uh, this is a system-wide approach of what is it do we need not only now in the short term but what do we need in the years to come where where are the the pressures that are becoming down the road so we can hopefully uh, nip some of those in the bud and be better prepared for potential uh, future shortfalls thank you and thank you dr loden julie who's next we have dr mula from regina next dr mula good morning please go ahead uh, uh, th this is uh, directed to both uh, Minister Merriman uh, and uh, the Minister for uh, Rural Health. Uh, I've been part of the uh, Practice Ready Assessment uh, SIPA program uh, from the start at the pilot. Uh, I recognize that there's a lot of uh, physicians who come through this program who uh, buy out their contract before uh, they are supposed to be completed, uh, whichever way it was. I think we spend quite a bit of money uh, assessing these physicians. And if they're given the opportunity uh, to buy out their contracts and the first opportunity they have, they leave. Uh, will the ministry think about uh, making sure that the option to buy out the contract is not uh, immediate, uh, rather uh, after a period of three to five years, uh, you know, when, when they have an opportunity to have served the, the communities they are recruited to? I don't know what the limitations are, but I would appreciate, you know, uh, being uh, thought being given to this. I brought this up at the previous RA a few years ago, and they said it was in the hands of the ministry. Thank you, Thank you for the question, Dr. Mula. Ministers? Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Mula, for the question. And it's a great question. We don't uh, want to create a transient workforce in our medical community. Um, what we have to uh, look at is, uh, you know, obviously there's there's some budgetary impacts to that, but we want to find that that very fine balance of being able to recruit individuals without having them locked in for an extended period of time, because otherwise they might not look at Saskatchewan, they might look at other provinces to say, well, it's easier over there and there's only a three-year contract versus Saskatchewan has a five, I can't buy out. So we continue to have to assess that to see what the workforce needs and what it is that we can do to maximize uh, the individuals that are coming through the SIPA program. Uh, hopefully, uh, we have some opportunities for them to create some roots in Saskatchewan and stay in Saskatchewan. That would be the ultimate success. But we want to we want to balance that fine line of being competitive, but not uh, being overbearing on individuals that want to come and use our SIPA program. As far as buying out the contracts, I, that's something that I'll have to look into. Uh, I've got uh, Max Hendricks on the line here, and we, so it's something certainly we can take away if there and look at how many people are buying out their contracts, how many people are doing uh, that, and if it's um, an ongoing concern because there is a significant upfront investment in these individuals, uh, the recruitment and all of the training that goes through. We want to make sure that we keep them here for the maximum amount of time that we can. Thank you. And thanks, Dr. Mula. Julie, who's the next delegate? Next, we have Dr. Lees from the section of internal medicine. Dr. Lees, good morning. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks to our honorable ministers for their time this morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, super happy to hear as, as the IM section chair in Saskatoon that we're funding more home care uh, because um, our elderly folks certainly need that and we want to care for them with dignity in their homes as much as possible. Um, in the IM section, we're quite concerned at, at record levels of inpatient admission still, even despite the pandemic, you know, being years in. And one of the things we've noticed is that a lot of the strategies proposed are reactive 
uh, increasing physician, you know, pe people or workforce, increasing nurses, when really we're quite interested in some proactive solutions uh, like addressing housing, uh, particularly in urban communities, addressing addictions, um, funding safe consumption sites. Um, and so what I was hoping, Minister Hindley, you could answer is first, uh, will you be funding a safe consumption site as part of your harm reduction strategy? And Minister Merriman, I was hoping you could comment on whether uh, housing initiatives uh, or, you know, changes to social assistance to support our, our, uh, our province's most vulnerable are being looked into, because I think that's the only way out of this. Thanks, Dr. Lees. Ministers? Sure, I'll uh, I'll start here first. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lisa, for uh, for the questions and uh, both the comments, uh, just both on, on the seniors' point of uh, uh, things there with home care and individualized funding, uh, but also uh, uh, your other comments uh, with respect to, to supervised consumption. Um, uh, at this point, no, we are not uh, funding uh, those sites specifically for for supervised consumption. Uh, I have met uh, recently with both uh, Prairie Harm Reduction and uh, the Neo Watina Friendship Center in uh, in Regina as well. To, to have some of these conversations. Uh, our focus thus far has been on the, not only prevention, but treatment and expansion of, of current harm reduction initiatives and trying to, with the dollars that we do have, to uh, to get as many resources out as we can to as many people as possible across the province. So through a number of uh, different initiatives, uh, some dollars, as I mentioned in my speech, towards locally based hotspotting initiatives to try and uh, uh, to get to people, uh, to, to reach them where they're at, um, in addition to uh, other uh, harm reduction initiatives whether it's uh, the mobile vans and that expansion of, of that project to community wellness buses, um, harm reduction, uh, drug checking strips uh, in the process now of, of mass spectrometer, uh, drug checking machines, um, and looking at some other uh, harm reduction initiatives as well, but also with a, with a specific focus on, on treatment and, uh, and tying people to treatment. It's why we've put some more dollars in this year's budget to expand treatment capacity. It's one of the things I hear from quite a bit from people that uh, either uh, are, are frontline providers providers or people who have lived experience. I've talked to some folks, I've been on a couple of podcasts and people that I've met with personally and directly have told me that one of their concerns is when they're uh, ready to access treatment, they can't get it quickly enough. So we got to do a better job of that. We have to make sure that, uh, that there is a, a quicker access for people to get into pre and post and, and also treatment, of course, itself and, and not the traditional old 28 day style of treatment, but the intensive the treatment that, that is required. So uh, we're committed to that at this point, but to, you know, always have Having discussions with our partners, both at the community, at the CBO level, um, discussions with our federal counterparts. There's a new Minister of Mental Health and Addictions there as well, and we're awaiting some additional details in terms of what the federal government's role is going to be when it comes to, to that ministry. But to, that's uh, basically where we're at uh, when it comes to, to that uh, particular issue. And uh, Minister Merriman? Sure. Thanks, Minister Henley. And, and good questions. Um, uh, we are doing, uh, Minister Henley's taken on a, a, a done a great job of getting into uh, the harm reduction and how we can help out individuals in location um, and just want to thank him for that. As far as the social assistance there, with my previous hat on as Minister of Social Services, this is something that's some, certainly near and dear to my heart. We created a program a few years ago called the SIS program, uh, which when individuals came into social assistance, they would uh, be identified as how did you get here? What were your barriers? Is it mental health and addictions? Is it employment? Is it debt? Is it, uh, you know, some family circumstances? How did you come into social assistance and come to this point where you needed government help? And how can we help you get, get back so you're not going to be on social assistance for an extended period of time? And there's many areas that we can do that with. Certainly housing is one. Uh, the Saskatchewan Housing Authority has a very good stock of housing. Now, some of that housing is uh, dated and needs to be updated. And Minister Carr is certainly working on that as far as updating for uh, the modern family versus a, um, a typical family where the Sask housing stock is, is around, uh, that was built around 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, we also have employment supplements to be able to help individuals if there's some employment challenges, some training dollars. We've uh, social assistance now has the training dollars that used to be in employment and immigration and working on that to be able to identify how can we help you get back to a place where you don't need to be on social assistance because in my time as minister and prior to that working with community-based organizations 
never met anybody that wanted to be on social assistance and how can we help them get to a point where they can be successful and be independent? What is it as a government and what is it as a community we can do to help those individuals? Thank you, and Dr. Lees. I'm told that the ministers are able to stay with us until 9.45. We'll take uh, another question. Who's next, Julie? We have Dr. Parvez in Regina. <laughs> Dr. Parvez, good morning. Please go ahead. Um, good morning, I'm Dr. Parvez. I'm the neonatologist and uh, president of the Regina Medical Staff Association. My question is moving from housing to parking. Um, parking in, around the Regina General Hospital has been recognized it's, it's a major issue and I'm a baby doctor. So most of my patients are in strollers and uh, mothers are carrying in and in minus 40, it's really hard to park like a kilometer away and come in and bring their patients, uh, especially when the snow is in the ground. My question is the budget is approved uh, for survey and establishing some sort of a parking lot around the general hospital. I really want to say thank you so much for that. Last few days, surveyor was around at the general hospital and I had a chance to look at them. I went and met them and I was told that it's going to take three years to make a plan. And after three years, the construction was going to start. So if the engineer was there and I said, I'm Dr. Parvez, can you please tell me how long this take to take, make the construction of the building? And I was told three to five years. Um, so just rough calculation, my baby will going to be eight years old and will be walking around and running around and will not going to need stroller um, till this parking lot is built. Um, my humble, humble request, can we do something about it to expedite or uh, make some sort of a temporary uh, quick fix? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank and you, thank you very Christ. much for that. And this is something that certainly Minister Henley and I, uh, I think it was the day after I got sworn in, um, uh, Minister Tell and Minister Ross and uh, um, MLA Fayez, uh, all the Regina MLAs came and it was right at the beginning of COVID. And they said, we need a parkade. I know COVID is important, but we need a parkade. Uh, and, and you absolutely do. We have, um, whoever you were talking to on site, uh, was giving you misinformation that was not accurate. Uh, we did have $750,000 in planning dollars this year. There was some geological work that was done a few years ago that just had to be updated just because uh, anybody that lives in Regina knows that uh, the Regina ground can shift a little bit here and there. So we've, uh, we're working on that. My goal is uh, to have people parking in that parkade within 24 months. That's the uh, goal that I would like to have out there and make sure that uh, individuals can park there because it is an issue in Regina and we want to have it done. So I've asked my officials to expedite things along with uh, the Minister for Sask Builds, get this moving, get the park gate in there and uh, get it up as soon as possible. In saying that, there's going to be disruptions and I want to be I want everybody at the, the general to know that there will be some disruptions because obviously construction's going on. So there will be some disruptions temporarily and anybody that worked at University Hospital while the Children's Hospital is being built will remember that vividly that it's not an uh, easy time and it's a little awkward. But my goal is to have that up and running within the next 24 months, uh, best case scenario, but depending on what happens between now and then, but it certainly won't be out five years, sir. Thank you. Julie, we can take one question and it will need to be brief. Who's next? We have Dr. Miller from Regina. Dr. Miller, please go ahead. Okay, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. So my name is Sarah Miller. I'm a general surgeon in Regina. Thank you so much for your address. I think you covered a lot of ground and a lot of the challenges that our healthcare system is facing. I'm um, obviously gonna be biased and interested about tackling this surgical backlog. Mm -hmm. um, we have finite resources. We have finite surgeons, finite anesthesiologists, nurses, support staff, you name it, OR rooms. So how are we gonna try and meet this backlog specifically to ramp up to the numbers that you mentioned in your address? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Millick. Very good question. And um, we have cranked up our service overall. I think we're at 97% uh, for the last three months and each week it gets a little bit better and better. We do have some hospitals like Humboldt, I've been told, are actually operating at 160% of their uh, normal surgical capacity or their scheduled surgery. So we are um, load leveling this across the system. 
this is a very aggressive target and we're going to have to use both uh, the public sector and the private sector that is publicly funded. Uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of these surgeries are day surgeries uh, that can be done, but we don't want to just drop down the numbers. My, my goal isn't just to hit 97,000 surgeries and take the low lying fruit of, you know, um, cataracts or um, ear tubes or, you know, and I'm probably not using the right terms in this, but I want to make sure that we're looking at the orthopedics as well, uh, that we're looking at uh, the major surgeries that have to be done and balancing that out. Uh, people have been very patient over the last two years. And we appreciate that. I know talking to surgeons, they want to get into the into surgery. They want to get that done. They want to start getting their patients in a better spot. The longer that they are lingering on the wait list, the worse they're going to get. So we want to make sure that we're done that. But it does come down to human resources. You're absolutely right. That's why we're trying to recruit as many as we can. We will steal them from other provinces. We will steal them from other states if we can get them up here to be able to do this. We want to make sure that we're maximizing our surgical capacity from what I'm being told from the SHA and the ministry is this is an achievable goal, but it is aggressive, but we're going to need all of the surgical capacity to be able to meet that goal. But this is something that I'm sure you as a surgeon and the people of Saskatchewan want to be able to get that surgical backlog down uh, to a very manageable time in the next two years. Ministers, thank you very much. As a testament to how much we appreciate uh, you joining us, there's a long line of people hoping to ask you questions. We want to be respectful of your time as you have been respectful of ours. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. If I could just maybe end with one comment. This doesn't end the, the conversation. If there are uh, physicians and many of you have reached out, Please contact Minister Henley and I by email if there's uh, follow-up questions that we didn't get to today. We're very open to hearing back from our, our doctors and our surgeons out there to, to inform us on how we can make better decisions. So the conversation doesn't stop here. Thank you very much. So for the de delegates who still have their hands raised, uh, please contact uh, the ministers by their email. Ministers, thank you very much.